Jim Stein Mayor. Mayor Meyer? Meyer. Jim, come on up. I've never met him. I've talked to him on the phone. I've always been intimidated by the conversations. <laughs> well, that's the truth. So, I love magic and stuff. I don't understand it at all. I just love it. So, he's my token little thing into magic today. That's nice. Is that nice? I'm the talking magician. He's the talking magician. Thank you. Okay, do Thank it. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. I, uh, I'm fortunate because my vocation and my avocation intersect. Uh, they're not exactly the same, but they intersect. I wonder if you could help me out. Could you take this, shuffle those, and, and pull 10 cards out of there. Take a tap packet of 10 cards out. Count them carefully. Have them ready, and I'll, I'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, I design illusions for magicians and for shows, uh, and I do work in television, producing magic for television. Uh, and a range of subjects along those lines. I also run a conference uh, slightly less uh, intimidating than this conference, which runs biennially in Los Angeles called the Conference on Magic History, in which we talk about historical magic. And one of the interests, uh, my great interest as a passion, uh, my, avo my vo avocation, is uh, historical magic. And uh, some of the recreations of what not only was amazing us today, but our grandparents and their grandparents. And it's amazing that it's all the same. And we've done some interesting things at the uh, Conference on Magic History, including recreations of illusions that haven't been seen for 100 years, 120 years, 75 years, that were done at the golden age of the turn of the century when Victorian and Edwardian magicians were performing. And these things are absolutely astounding today. It's, it's wonderful to sit with a group of 200 magicians who are state-of-the-art magicians with tears in their eyes watching something they never thought they'd see, let alone something they never thought they'd be amazed by. One of the things I don't do is perform so in the TED tradition, I'm going to perform a trick for you now. Uh, <clears throat> I, I work with really great performers, and about 15 years ago when I started doing that, I resolved to stop performing myself because uh, I wasn't in that league. But I want to do a, a little demonstration for you. Can I just have that packet? That's fine. Hold on to the rest of the cards. Thank you. And you don't mind if I count these again? Just to, uh, Not that I don't trust you. I just want to make sure that uh, there really are 10 cards. It's very important. And so I'm going to count these slowly. And those of you, especially in front, you might be able to uh, remember one or two of the cards as they go by. That would make things a little easier. We, you don't have to remember all of them. Here's number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, number ten. Very good. Ten cards. Now, this is actually a little demonstration. You've heard about magicians doing this, where they use their sleeves to perform magic. And uh, many people think that's not actually true. But actually, it is true. Magicians are able to push things up their sleeves. And by way of explanation, I'm going to use these 10 cards and this pocket, which I will turn out and uh, demonstrate that it's empty conveniently. This pocket over here and also this sleeve, my right sleeve, in fact, the right sleeve over here. Watch very closely because you see with a, when I snap one card up like that, it goes up the sleeve, across, over, inside the pocket like that. That's number one. I'll do that again for those of you that weren't watching closely enough. Don't worry, I want everyone to understand this by the time I leave tonight. One card goes all the way up, all the way over, across, inside the pocket. That's number two. Now, very difficult. Uh, this is just the work for someone who's been doing this for a while. Please don't try this at home. Two cards at once. That takes a very distinct snap. And in fact, two cards go into the pocket. There's number one. And there's number two. Number two. Sometimes they get hung up when they have to make the sharp right turn. That's what I get for wearing a sweater. There's number two. Now, <clears throat> those of you uh, that have been counting along with me, and I hope you have, observe that there are four cards there, and that should leave six cards in my hand. In fact, I have one, two, three, four, five, six playing cards in my hand. Watch very closely, and in particular, watch the card right in the middle of the fan, because it goes all the way up, across, over, inside. There's one. And now in my hand, there are five cards. One, two, three, four. Five. Halfway there. You all understand how this is working, of course. So I'll demonstrate a little slower, starting with the fifth card. Just takes a little snap, and you see that card is gone. That's really true, because if I count the cards now, you'll see there's one, two, three, four cards in my hand. And that means that the card has gone inside. 
Sometimes they take a shortcut. There we go, there's one over there. Try it again. One snap, there's the card in my pocket. Two at once, let's see if I can do this with one loud snap. There's uh, card number one and card number two. Two cards in my pocket, and of course that leaves one card in my hand, conveniently. The last card, the last card, the one you've been waiting for, everyone waits for the last one. We use a little different technique for this, a little different technique. Watch closely, the card goes all the way up, across, over, inside. I see you, this audience, is a little too sophisticated for that. We'll have to do something a little more. <clears throat> I'll hold it between the tips and the tips only of my fingers. The card disappears, goes all the way up, across, over, inside. You remember the name of the card? It's the Ace of Spades. That's the last card, number 10. Now, I'm going to talk a little about that trick. I, I want to give you a history of it. It's a very old trick. It's a trick that's at least 150 years old. We have a record of it being described by Robert Rodin, the, the most innovative magician of the 19th century, uh, a Parisian magician who wrote textbooks on magic. And it was done uh, consistently. It was a standard of magic in some form or another. Everyone did their own variations of it for probably at least 50 years. Uh, I would say that about 50 years ago, it had died out. It was a, it was a, a, a trick that was a victim of its times. I don't know why, but magic, like everything else, has fashions, and it's a trick that you don't see magicians doing today, the cards to pocket. Every magician did something a little different with it, and everyone did their own combinations of it, and this is, in fact, some of my own combinations. And I want to talk a little bit about what's happening in this trick. Even though I'm not supposed to, I'm going to tell you how it's done. And there's a reason for that. Now, magicians are very, very guarded with their secrets. They're very secretive about what they do, and there's a very good reason for that. The example that I use, the analogy I use, is that magicians guard an empty safe. The secrets of magic are incredibly worthless. But the empty safe has to be guarded so you don't find out that it's empty. In fact, there isn't a secret that magicians use that is beyond probably a fourth grade science class. Uh, but those things, which are very, very simple when we talk about technology, we talk about things like a rubber band or a little piece of thread or a piece of black fabric. I mean, that's technology to magicians. And, and the stranger thing is to actually hear people talking about the right kind of rubber band to use, you know, and, and, and how exciting it is finding the right kind of rubber band. Very, very simple pieces of technology. The problem with magic is that most people, when they hear a little bit about how it's done, they lose interest. And it's getting from that first plateau that it's a rubber band to the next plateau, which is that a rubber band can provide seven minutes of entertainment that magicians are able to do that, that most people aren't. Would you find me 10 other cards in there, please, if you would, please, just as you did before. Now, this trick, uh, this trick was written up in 1905, a classic book of magic, The Expert at the Card Table by S.W. Erdnays, who said that the secret of the trick is masterly feats of palming and unflinching audacity, <laughs> which even for a magic book was a very, very strange description of how this works. And I want to talk to you a little about that. Now, the secret is very, very simple. And, and this is the secret that would send you out of the room saying, this is incredibly boring. I'm taking the cards in my hand and putting them in my pocket. OK? That's it. It's over. That's it. Goodbye. <laughs> and that's where most magic stops. And that's where most of it is deflated. And now I'm going to tell you not how it works. I'm going to tell you why it works, why this trick from 150 years ago which has been handed down and handed down and went through different hands and was performed by different great magicians, why it works. Now, what magic is about is about setting up a different kind of reality. And one of the things you'll read in the Cub Scout Book of Magic and all the other books of magic, besides Never Tell the Secret of the Trick, which I'm violating already, I would be kicked out of the International Brotherhood of Magicians, but I've resigned already. So, uh, <laughs> uh, the only thing that, that, that they say besides that is never do the same trick twice for the same audience. And there's a reason for that, which is, of course, when you see what's coming, the element of surprise isn't there. And yet this trick, this classic construction, does the same trick ten times. Ten cards go one by one to the pocket. You see it coming on the second card. You know, all I have to do is get there with number ten, and, and there the whole plot has been played out. But in fact, that's part of the deception, that kind of metronome of one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 10, that kind of steady metronome is part of the deception, because that is not the metronome that's accomplishing the trick. There's a whole different rhythm 
that's accomplishing it. And what this brings to mind is what's happening in a magic show. There are three scripts being played out at the same time in a performance of magic. There's the obvious script, which is what I say and what I'm doing and you're observing. There's a second script, which is what's secretly being done to accomplish it. And then there's a third script, which is trying to anticipate where you are in the thought processes. I mean, you think of this, I try to get magicians to think of this as dropping breadcrumbs along a path and leading them from point A to point Z. And if you can't anticipate where the audience is, they'll get there or they'll get somewhere else where you don't want them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you exactly how this sets up. When I do this version of it, I start with one extra card, and you'll see why in a second. I put that in this pocket, a kind of unmemorable card. The Six of Clubs is a good one, for example. Nothing that stands out because I don't want anyone to notice that uh, you didn't see it before. Ten cards. Thank you very much. You can just hold on to the rest of those. And I count them out very slowly so everyone can see one, two, three, four, five, and already I'm doing something. I'm going to take the first move and I'm going to break it up into three separate moves because I don't want to do it all at once. I'm going to do it as slowly and take my time getting into it as I can. So after five cards, I put my fingertip out and the sixth card pushes against my fingertip. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, that's about a sixteenth of an inch that does that. But now I have a break with a fingertip between the fifth card and the sixth card. As I square up the cards, I transfer that break from this fingertip to the bottom, to the little finger. And if I hold it this way to you, edgewise to you, you can't see that. Okay? This is a standard technique. This is a very, very simple, very basic sleight of hand. I show the pocket and I turn the pocket in. And as I square these cards, I execute what magicians call a two-handed top palm which is that I take the cards above the break, five cards, and I push them into this hand as I square the cards. Now I hold on to the cards so that I don't leave this hand in an unnatural position, and I indicate the sleeve, and I go right from here to the pocket. Now I know that that is what is called misdirection. That's a very, very basic technique for magicians, which is basically, and it's quite crude in that form, that if you look up here, for that moment, you can direct attention away from something else that's happening. Now, misdirection is an interesting thing, though, because it doesn't work the same in different situations. For instance, this room's a little bit too large, ideally, for this. On television, when we do things like this, a screen, when it reduces that distance, I can't get a separation, a shift of your eye. So I have to rely less on that. Because on a television screen, that might only be an inch and a half or two inches difference. Okay, ideally, this sort of thing, the product of its time, was done in a salon or a drawing room. And in fact, I'm aware that an audience in this area has a shift. Yes. Uh, so the audience has a shift from one spot to the other, from my hand to the pocket. Okay, now, if you're paying attention, and I hope you have been, that's the first card that I pull out. And you'll say, hey, this is great. He's already halfway through. He's put half the cards in his pocket. And this brings us back to the metronome that I'm talking about. The fact that there's a steady click, 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 ostensibly of what I'm doing, but it's really swinging wildly. I mean, I've swung way past what I have to do, and now this is great. I'm halfway through. But so I'm going to take that advantage to set up the fake metronome. I'm going to convince you that the cards are going one by one. Okay? And I have that luxury now because I'm halfway there. So the second card what I do is a little faint because at this point I know from doing this previously this is where people start to think are those going in his hand? So I do a little faint just as if it might be there and then show you that it isn't and that's card number two. And of course the same thing with the two cards at once of course they're already there. I don't really expect an audience to believe that by doing this it releases the card. It's just a little bit of acting <laughs> and it gives the impression of course the plot of the trick that the cards are going one by one. Now at this point, I have one card left and I'm going to give people the impression that there are six cards in my hand. There are actually five. So this is what we call a false count. Again, it's a very, very simple piece of sleight of hand. One, two, three, four, five, six cards. I'm not going to tell you the details of that. It's actually a very, very standard, very old move and there are very many variations on it. More important is the rhythm of it than actually any sleight of hand. Just the notion that it matches all the other ways I've been counting the cards. So now we have six cards. I do one other little feint just to give you the impression that the cards are traveling one by one, which is that the one card goes singly up, across, over, and in. 
and I square these up and show them. All I'm doing, of course, is just pulling the one card up against my fingertips this way to give you the impression that it's going in that moment. Now, from my experience with this, I have to change the rhythm. I have to change the metronome of the trick because I'm headed for a really bad moment, which is the second steal. Okay, this is where all the heat is on. This is where you're going to, you're going to find it. So I'm going to change the rhythm of what the trick is. And I'm going to start that by doing the next one with a false count. Five cards, one, two, three, four, five. And I give them a snap, and I demonstrate that there are four. And this is, again, a false count. Just as I could count five as six, I'll now count five as four. This is a move magicians call a buckle count, which means that there's a little buckle with the finger, which is what does the trick. One, two, three, four cards. Okay, again, I don't have to show you the details of this. This is something learned in the privacy of your own room. <laughs> like much of magic. At the point at which I square these up, I get a break, just as I did before, over one of the cards. And now I use this card that I prepared beforehand to change the rhythm of what I'm doing, which is that I reach in this pocket to find it. It's not there. And I have to transfer these cards from hand to hand. And as I do that, another top palm, and I reach in and take out this card, the extra one. Now I'm already again, once again, I'm ahead. So these cards go directly into these, this hand and the palm cards go in, okay? And I mean, all of those side steps, all of those half steps are simply so that that move can be as smooth and effortless as it can be. All right, once again, I snap one and then two and I withdraw two, demonstrating that there's one card in my hand and this is the last card. And the last card, once again, I have to change the meter of this. Now, when I talk to magicians about this, I talk about moves being done not on the inhale, but on the exhale. You know, you want the audience to ah, exhale, figuratively or literally, even better, as the card is going, as the slight is occurring. So I'm going to set up a little exhale, and that exhale is to throw your moment by doing something really kind of foolish at this point which is the expectation is that it's going to happen on this beat and so on that beat I do instead of a trick I do something silly okay the last move that takes the card all the way from here over here is the pendulum swinging way past it missing it and then having it to get pushed back right at the last minute I'll show you what that means this is a move that is uh, has an interesting history to it it's called the back palm which uh, is a misnomer you the palms on the front of your hand not the back of your hand um, sometime before the turn of the century, a Mexican gambler came into Otto Maurer's magic shop in New York City and uh, went to Otto Maurer and showed him this move and then vanished into the streets of Broadway. No one knew his name, no one knew where the move came from, but Otto Maurer remembered it. And he showed some of the most important magicians of that day, including a young man named Howard Thurston. Howard Thurston took this move and developed an entire act around it and became uh, America's great magician of the Roaring Twenties. The back palm is a move where the card is actually placed against the back of your hand. And magicians later improved upon it by doing what they called an equipment, which was that they could then transfer it to the front of their hand and back again. <laughs> now, <laughs> alone in a room, you can find all the secrets. <laughs> The problem with the back palm, which Howard Thurston discovered, is Howard Thurston couldn't control the theaters he was working in. He was working in enormous theaters. And the equipment, you, you people admired it, but you people didn't. Because an equipment is very, very angly to magicians. As, as the hand moves around, it tends to flash at extreme angles as the card moves. So Howard Thurston found that by swinging his hand up behind his body this way, he could perform the equipment behind his body. It's very crude, but it, it answered his purposes. Now that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use my body as the cover. Okay? And the other thing I want to do is I want to avoid the cliche of the back palm because I suspect that too many uncles have shown too many nieces and nephews the back palm. <laughs> and that when you hold a card like this, you all know what's coming. So I start by holding the card upright between my fingertips. And as I shift it here, I move it to the back of my hand, to the back of this hand. Okay? This hand goes down, and just like Howard Thurston did, I can transfer it to the front of my hand against my body. And I know that, again, for a few seconds, the misdirection here is very strong. Okay? My hand's up in the air. I reach into the pocket, pull out the extra card. 
because of course I have one extra card because I introduced one earlier. And then as both hands come together, that one goes back in the pocket and this one is switched for the one in my hand. I'll do it once more. The card's gone here between my fingertips. One card in my pocket. Remember the name of it, it's the Queen of Hearts. Queen of Hearts. Now, you're all sworn to secrecy. <laughs> I think you understand that the problem with magic is, again, that many people will not sit through that. Not many people don't have Ricky locking the doors and make you sit through that. You know, you'll hear, oh, he had the cards in his hand. Oh, I thought it was more interesting than that. Well, okay. <laughs> But there's a lot going on in this performance. There's a lot going on as the rhythm of things change and fall behind and catch up. There's a lot of anticipation of what the audience is going to be looking at. And I think you'll also understand that a good performer will take that trick and with their own peculiarities, even with their own differences in timing, slight differences in timing, will fool you very badly with it. You know, in 10 minutes or an hour. Okay, because the peculiarities that I bring to it, the way I handle things in my own timing, affects very strongly that illusion. And it's all about the timing. Now, these are little plays. They're, they're, they're really little plays, and the technology part of it is very, very simple. And one of the things, when I talk to magicians about this subject, or when I talk to magicians, or when I work with directors or writers, putting these effects in shows, is... There's a misnomer that these things are, are the art of deception. Magicians love to say that, you know, we, uh, our art is the art of deception. And I'm not so sure that's true. I, I don't know if a magician is any more an artist of deception than a used car salesman or an advertising executive, for example. You know. And in fact, and I say that with all compliments to those professions, of course. Uh, I'm not so sure that the deception isn't focusing on the wrong part of it. The example I use is that it's the hole in the center of the donut, the deception. And that you can talk about the hole, but the only way you define it is by defining everything else around it. So the only way that these things become a deception, the only way they become entertaining to an audience is by defining all the elements around it. And that by focusing on the deception, that's really wrong. And I think to this point, there was a great quote by Constable, the uh, British landscape painter, who, talking about his own art of painting landscapes, he said, the art pleases by reminding, not by deceiving by reminding, not by deceiving. And I think the real art of the magician, of great magicians, is that they know the art of reminding. They know the art of reassuring. Because the performance is based in these tiny, infinitesimal reassurances that everything is right. That you understand everything that's happening. That everything is part of your shared experience. And in that sense, the safe is really not empty. The safe is full. Great magicians, I think, understand that even intuitively. Now, there's one other point, just relative to magic and technology, which is because there's so little overlap between magic and technology, except on this kind of psychic level. And I think it's best I'll, I'll describe it to you. When I, was a, when I was a boy, I grew up in the Midwest, and I used to walk home, uh, and I remember picking up maple leaves which I remember as big as a pillowcase. I was smaller then. Uh, they were still probably pretty big. And they were bright red. They were magenta. They were a very strange color. And the color is very, very vivid. And they're very unusual. And I collected these and would bring them home. And no one was interested in them. You know, they had already dealt with raking them. <laughs> Generations of raking them. They weren't interesting. And then at some point around fourth grade in science class, someone explained to me, we, we've got it all figured out. You know, let me explain what's happening. The chlorophyll dies in the leaf. The chlorophyll is green. The leaf turns red and falls off the tree. Don't worry about it. It's all taken care of. <laughs> now, I have to confess to you today, I still don't know why leaves turn red. Because I know that things don't really make sense. Sense is assigned in retrospect. And that if the leaves jumped off the trees screaming or burst into flames, or balled themselves up and jumped on top of me, that would make as much sense. <laughs> the chlorophyll dies, the leaf goes crazy, it jumps off the tree screaming. <laughs> We've got it all figured out. And it occurs to me that the more there is not only technology in the world, and the more that people are told, don't worry about it, it's all taken care of, we figured it out, 
There's a kind of numbing effect to all of this. And there's a real need to have something that's special and unique and magical. Because so many times we're told to stop wondering about things. And that's why, in an interesting way, the most basic elements of magic, you know, with a coin and your hand and a couple cards and a pocket, you all know what a pocket is. You all know what your hands are. You all know what a coin is. You've all handled playing cards. And when you're shown something extraordinary about those elements, there's a light that goes on. There's something about these things that I've never understood before. And that's the experience with the leaf when you're five years old. That's the experience that reminds you of the things that you've been taught to stop caring about. And at least for a momentary flash, that's something that connects with you and there's a resonance of, of being a child and looking at things in a new way again. In any case, I appreciate you uh, sitting through this demonstration. Please keep the secret. Thank you very much for your time.